open the next session connected with Gregory Chibotarev on a lecture, which will be presented by Dr. Chris Haberfield. But now I am giving space to Dr. Michael Rissiu to introduce the lecture. Please. Dear friends, dear colleagues, it's my great pleasure to be here and make a short introduction to the lecture of Grigory Chebotaryov. I think a uh, new generation maybe n n do not know very much about uh, Grigory Chebotaryov, and I would like uh, just a few facts about him. By the way, this uh, lecture, Chibataryov lecture is the second lecture. The, sec uh, the first lecture was given in St. Petersburg three years ago by Mike Jemelkovsky about uh, stability of Zhilazny Most. So uh, I would like to tell just a few words about Grigory Ch Chibataryov. Uh, he was born in St. Petersburg and he belonged to higher class of nobility. His uh, family was very close to the family of uh, uh, Emperor Nicholas II. In the State Transport University, where uh, Chibataryov received his education, his uh, friend was uh, Petro Timoshenko, a very uh, famous name, who uh, later became famous due to application of theory elasticity to structures and buildings. Later, Grigory Chibataryov moved to America and uh, made a nice career in America. And he also uh, always uh, emphasized the importance of soil structure interaction approach to all types of geotechnical challenges. He used to say that uh, in his days, analytical methods of calculations are sufficiently Sufficient, not sufficiently strong to tackle big, powerful uh, tasks of soil structure interaction. But time will come when geotechnical engineers will devise new methods of calculations. And he was absolutely right. The lecture will be delivered by our co-member Chris Haberfield. Uh, and now, my present duty is to introduce to you Dr. Chris Haberfield. I'm asking him to go forward. Dr. Chris Haberfield is a principal geotechnical engineer with Golder Associates. Chris has background from Sydney and Monash universities, where he is still partly involved. He has extensive research and practical experiences in foundation structure interaction in all types of soil and rock, but in particular in soft, deep, and weather rock. With respect to the different types of geotechnical structure, there is probably none in which he was not involved. Therefore, we are looking forward to his second Gregory Chibotario lecture, where he is focusing on most important problem of geotechnical structure design on soil structure interaction problem. Dr. Chris Haberfield, may I ask you to start with your presentation? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, or oh, it's actually good morning, everybody. At the outset, I would just like to thank TC207 and the IWSMGE for giving me the honour to present this lecture. Many in our industry share safety moments at every meeting, so I would like to start my talk by giving a safety meeting, because safety is paramount. Sitting at our desks, undertaking soil structure interaction analysis, we often forget about the safety which has to be, occur out in the field. For example, how often do we think about how we construct a lift overrun pit? It's not part of the major excavation, but it can cause serious problems. All the engineers involved in these excavations you see here thought the excavation was safe, unsupported. They were wrong. 
The ones on the right, the engineers involved in that, are both being prosecuted under the Health and Safety Act at this very time. So I would like to urge, thank you, I would like to urge the IWSMGE at future meetings to introduce a safety moment like I have just done. In this lecture, I hope to give you an appreciation of soil structure interaction as it is used every day in design offices around the world. I aim to do this through examples of real projects, showing you some of the many tools at our disposal, both simple and complex. The importance of adopting appropriate inputs and how SSI gives us the confidence, in the words of William Shatner, to boldly go where no man has gone before. I will also raise some concerns regarding some commonly adopted design philosophies. Professor Shebatoriev was a prominent early pioneer in soil structure interaction analysis who emphasised the importance of combining the structure and soil together into one problem. The fundamentals that are used are still applicable today. However, our understanding of soil and rock behaviour and the SSI tools that we have available are much improved. This tends to instil in us a confidence that is often not warranted and may be misguided. It is timely that we would be reminded of the fundamentals as too often we simply believe the answers we get from our analysis without appropriate calibration, checking or sensitivity studies and on occasions even without a sanity check. For those of you who do not undertake SSI analysis, I provide the following simple introduction. In essence, every structure interacts with the ground in some way, whether it is uh, a footing requiring support from the ground or a tunnel that may have to support uh, earth and groundwater pressures, or a cantilever retaining wall which needs to support and resist the ground. It follows then that the behaviour of the ground and the structure are dependent on each other, but these in turn depend on construction sequence, timing, ground and structure properties and so on. This can and does result in very complex interactions within the structure, within the ground and between the structure and the ground. Quantifying these interactions requires a good understanding of both geotechnical and structural engineering. One simple structure that illustrates the main aspects of soil structure interaction is a buried culvert. In this particular example, twin concrete culverts are being constructed at the base of an excavation. The culverts are to be buried under deep fill. There are numerous approaches that could be used to analyse this problem. The first is a simple structural frame analysis where the culvert is modelled using structural plate elements and the estimated horizontal and vertical earth pressures that represent the full depth of burial are applied. This is not a good model and result in poor estimates of the behaviour and design reaction in the culverts, the reasons for which will become clear. Approach two uses a full two-dimensional finite element or similar analysis where the soil and culvert are wished into place. This is an improvement on the previous approach as it more accurately models the earth pressures and interaction between the culvert and the soil. However, it is still a poor approximation to the actual behaviour as it does not follow the construction process and will provide incorrect answers. The third and most accurate approach is to model the full construction process through excavation of the shaft, placement of the culvert and gradual backfilling the shaft in thin layers of compacted fill. In this way, the changes of the properties of the backfill with increasing backfill depth can be reasonably modelled and the deformations in the arch during backfilling which see the walls of the arch initially move inwards and then reverse as the backfilling depth increases above the top of the culvert. These deformations are locked in by the stiffness of the surrounding soil and result in a very different deformed shape and therefore bending moments and shear forces in the culvert than are calculated using the previous two approaches. The aim of any design is to be prudent and robust. It must also be safe and economic to build. Over the last 50 years, and our knowledge and our access to SSI analysis have allowed us to achieve all of these, with structures now significantly larger, heavier, more slender and more economical to build than they were some time ago. A few decades ago, SSI analysis was in its infancy as we know it today. The finite element structural analysis packages 
uh, we use today were only just be being developed and were gradually finding their way into consulting engineering offices. The computers back then were primitive by today's standards and there were severe limitations on the analysis that could be undertaken and the constitutive models available. Subgrade reaction models were common and, are, and still are amongst our structural engineer uh, colleagues. The limitations and accuracies of subgrade or spring models are now well understood and can be simply demonstrated by considering a raft subjected to a uniformly distributed load. The bending moments calculated depend on the support, spring supports, uh, how many there are, what their relative stiffness are, and so on. The use of spring reports with the same stiffness uh, is incorrect and will result in incorrect displacement, bending moments and shear forces in the raft. This is simply because the ground is a continuum. It is not a series of springs. Nevertheless, spring models are still widely used in consulting and we have to deal with them. Through practical necessity, structural engineers use springs to model footings at the base of their columns of their tall buildings and so on. To do this correctly, the springs are not constant but vary depending on many factors, including magnitude and duration of load, geometry, footing size, interaction effects, and so on. It's up to us, the geotechnical engineer, to provide appropriate spring stiffness values to the structural engineer, and those pro values we provide need to be based on realistic methods which, which we use SSI analysis for. As I said, design must be prudent, <coughs> robust, practical, and economic to, to build. Soil structure internet act action analysis are an important part of achieving this. Unfortunately, many of the design approaches in standards and other design guidelines that we use every day do not promote the correct use of SSI analysis. For example, guidance provided for embedded retaining walls promote the use of factored down strength and stiffness parameters of the soil for ultimate limit state analysis. Curiously, no reduction parameters or factors are applied to other important parameters, such as unit weight or in situ horizontal stress. In any case, in my view, the approach is incorrect. One aim of SSI analysis must be to obtain the most accurate estimate of performance as is practical, whilst considering the potential variation in parameters within reasonable bounds. Reasonable SSI analysis cannot be achieved if factored down parameters are used, as these are no longer realistic and result in unrealistic performance uh, of the ground and the structure. An alternative approach, which is more conducive to the use of SSI analysis, is to use the same prudently conservative best estimate of properties that we use for serviceability limit state in the ultimate limit state case. The SSL analysis considers likely scenarios regarding construction, groundwater, etc., while the ULS analysis considers credible worst case scenarios, uh, scenarios such as accidental loading and overdig, high groundwater, and or flooding, earthquake, and so on. The outputs from the analysis, rather than the inputs, are then factored appropriately, with potentially different factors being applied for ULS and SLS conditions. An, S, an accurate SSI analysis requires representative soil structure properties and constitutive models. There are numerous, numerous constitutive models are available, ranging from simple to very complex, with the very complex requiring inputs, which can be impractical to reasonably determine, certainly from a consultant's point of view. For everyday design purposes, a balance between capturing the key features of the soil behaviour and avoiding the need for excessively complex and perhaps unnecessary inputs is required. In general terms, the simpler the model, the better, provided it adequately captures the critical behaviour of the soil in the problem being investigated. For example, the culvert example I showed you previously, the increasing stiffness of the fill with increasing depth of burial and therefore mean effective stress is a key factor which needs to be modelled. As a result, a constituent model that can simulate this, such as a modified cam clay model or similar, is required. The choice of the constitutive model can have a significant impact on the analysis and significant engineering judgment and knowledge is required to select the right model and to use it correctly. In any case, SSI analysis should start with a simple model and dare I say it, a simple more cool on model, then proceed to the more complex. 
Another example illustrating the importance of, ch of choice of the constituent model is the analysis of the retention system for a deep basement embedded weak and fractured sedimentary rock with compressive strengths typically between about 1 MPA and 3 MPA. Many of the basements in my hometown of Melbourne are dug in such material. The bedding planes generally strike north-south and can be persistent for hundreds of metres with friction angles generally between 25 and 35 degrees but can be fully welded. Slick and sided bedding planes with friction angles of as low as 12 degrees are common, but they usually do not have great persistence. In other words, they're only a few metres long. Such bedding planes can be easily accommodated in design. Persistent slick and sided bedding planes are rare, but they do occur, as I will show you in the next example, and we experience this firsthand. One such bedding plane is shown circled in the bottom photograph. It's very hard to see. This bedding plane dips about 25 degrees into the excavation and is continuous over a length of 150 metres, if not more. You can see a portion of this bedding plane next to the men in the photograph. A vertical release plane at the one end of the excavation allowed the large rock block behind the retention system to slide on this bedding plane, resulting in excessive movement, which required urgent mitigation measures. Fill berm followed by post-tension anchors uh, to be employed. Fortunately, the mitigation measures were successful. It is clear from this example that the failure mechanism that needs to be modelled is block sliding on one or more bedding planes. <coughs> so how do we analyse this problem <coughs> with the tools that we have? There are some common approaches. The first is to use a continuum approach as shown in the upper figure where the bedding planes are not explicitly modelled but are accounted for by reducing the strength and stiffness properties adopted in the analysis. If the anisotropy of the rock uh, mass is to be incorporated, a ubiquitous joint model can be used. However, the ubiquitous joint model effectively simulates an infinite number of weak planes, all with the same strength. Neither of these models can reasonably model the mechanism of relatively rigid blocks sliding along intermediate low-strength bedding planes. A second approach, which provides a better representation of this mechanism, is to use a hybrid approach between a mass and distinct element approach, shown in the bottom figure. I call this a discontinuum approach. In this approach, distinct dis discontinuity planes are included in the mass approach by incorporating interface elements at critical locations, for example, at the end of an excavation phase, and adopting higher strength and stiffness properties for the rock mass between the interface elements. The strength of individual discontinuities can be changed to reflect a prudently conservative bedding plane strength or a lower bound slick and slided friction angle as required. A third approach, and potentially the most accurate approach, is to use a distinct element model. But there would be very few people in this audience uh, familiar with that, so I will, I will leave that for another day. The results of deformation shown here are for the, the continuum approach <coughs> and discontinuum approach down the bottom. And you can see the displacement profiles are significantly different. As a result, the structural actions or reactions in the, in the retention system will be different. The continuum approach calculates higher anchored forces, pile bending moments and displacements, and lower shear forces than the discontinuum model using moderately conservative parameters. However, the continuum model is not suitable for modelling the case which includes a, occasional low strength bedding planes. The discontinuum model is suitable for modelling this and indicates that if such low strength bedding planes are present, and we don't know they are, the retention system designed on the basis of moderately conservative bedding plane strength is not sufficiently robust, resulting in a requirement to strengthen the retention system. The, the ubiquitous joint model in this case failed to converge. The strengthening of the retention system sufficiently to mitigate the presence of continuous low strength bedding planes, should they occur, comes at significant cost and may be cost prohibitive for many basement excavations. However, such bedding planes are rare. So the question arises, should we consider them in the SLS case, should we consider them in the ULS case, or should we not consider them at all? A reasonable, safe, cost-effective and practical approach, in my view, may be to rely on the analysis using moderately conservative bedding plane properties for design of the retention system. Then check the performance of the retention system, assuming continuous low-strength bedding planes at 
critical locations uh, and making sure the retention system has sufficient strength to prevent sudden collapse, but not to mitigate uh, movement. This would need to be coupled with an appropriate monitoring and action plan should movements exceed those from the design. And that's basically how we do it these days. As indicated by the last couple of examples, our tools for undertaking SSI analysis have advanced considerably since the days of using subgrade reaction models. The greatest advancements have occurred over the last decade or so, primarily due to the easy access to high-speed computers and access to sophisticated commercially available software packages. Full 3D analysis of the structure on the ground are, how, how, are however less common, but are being undertaken by a few design officers. One such model from our Russian friends is shown here, and I encourage you to read some of their papers which, gen which illustrate the top end of SSA capabilities at this time. With easy access to complex SSI tools, there has become a tendency to use complex methods without first exploring other methods which may provide a similar answer in quicker time. While complex models have their place, they are time consuming and complex to develop and the potential for errors in the input is high. Simple methods which model the critical elements of the problem should be used whenever possible and certainly as a precursor to complex analysis. Simple methods help us to better understand the problem being modelled, provide calibration and checks for the more complex methods allow sensibilities, sensitivity studies to be undertaken quickly and are fast and inexpensive. The advantage of re relatively simple and complex tools is illustrated by this next example. About 20 years ago, two moderate towers were planned for redevelopment of a site on the Yarra River in Melbourne. I'll refer to these as Towers 2 and 3. Tower 2 it's 20 levels and tower 3 is 31 levels and there's a 6 level podium surrounding both towers. The subsurface stratigraphy comprises about 37 metres of de marine deposits and alluvium over weak siltstone rock as indicated by the stratigraphic column shown. The original design of the footing system was based on bore piles founding in the siltstone as shown by the green column. Due to concerns that pre driven precast piles may not penetrate the dense gravels. The building was tendered on a design and construct basis, as is common in Australia. After the successful piling contractor demonstrate they could drive the piles to the rock, the footing design was changed to precast concrete piles, which could be installed at substantially lower cost. Unfortunately, the piling personnel on site did not understand the requirement to drive the piles to rock, but instead to drive the piles to a predetermined set. As a result, most of the piles found in the dense gravel depicted by the red column. This was only discovered after all the piles had been installed. Concerns were raised over potential settlement that could occur due to compression of the stiff to very stiff clay underlying the gravel. Analysis were undertaken to estimate the settlements of both towers. The original analysis of the footing system taken about 20 years ago, we only had relatively simple two-dimensional uh, models available. This drawing shows the footing layout for Tower 3. Obviously, it's a three-dimensional problem. Each column of the building is supported by a group of 350 square precast piles, as indicated by the purple-coloured squares. The piles found the top of the dense gravel layer, as I said before. The critical aspect of this problem with respect to settlement of the towers is the time-dependent consolidation and creep of the stiff to very stiff clay layer below the piles. Our initial analysis focused on calculation uh, calculating the change in vertical stress in the clay layer. This was done by using flak to quantify the stress distribution below each pile group and through the clay. This stress distribution was approximated using best fit polynomials, which were then utilised in an Excel spreadsheet to calculate the total change in vertical stress due to overlapping stress bulbs for each pile group. Conventional one-dimensional uh, consolidation creep theory were then used to calculate the compression of the clay. Nothing particularly smart. The results of this analysis of the tower are presented on this slide. The calculated change in total effective stress is shown in the left-hand figure and calculated total sum in the tower in the right-hand figure. This is one of just several calculations we considered variations in the properties and thickness of the clay layer. The total sediment of the tower was calculated by adding the sediment of each isolated pile group, assuming no clay was present, to the calculated compression of the clay. 
the total settlement of Tower 3 of in excess of 80 millimetres, with correspondingly large differential settlements considered to be unacceptable by the designers, and remediation measures would need to be implemented. The calculated settlement differential settlements for Tower 2 were, however, considered to be satisfactory, and no remedial piling was undertaken. This proved to be the correct decision, as the best estimate of measured settlements at the end of construction proved to be very close to the calculated settlements, as shown by the two contour plots which compare calculated settlements on the left with measured settlements on the right. Several remediation options were considered for Tower 3, but the one chosen following successful driving piles was to supplement selected heavily loaded pile groups with one or more steel H-piles driven to refusal in the rock underlying the clay. The final remediated pile layout is shown where the red circles represent the originally installed precast concrete piles and the black squares the driven H-piles. Further analysis were required to prove up the proposed remedial design. The analysis would need to calculate settlement and the load in the piles. And of particular interest was the load in the H-piles, which would be the stiffest elements within each pile group and hence carry a high load. The spreadsheet was revised to include H-piles with load sharing between the piles being calculated on a simple compatibility requirement that the pile top settlement was the same for the H-piles as the pile group. The stiffness of the H-piles was based on back analysis from dynamic load tests. This approach allowed a rapid assessment of the required number and location of the H-piles, the loads in the H-piles and the settlement of the tower, as well as sensitivity studies regarding the thickness and properties of the clay and stiffness of the H-piles. The calculated displacement of the remediated footing system for Tower 3 is shown in the contour plot. A maximum tower settlement at the end of construction was 20 millimetres calculated. The maximum measured displacement of the tower was 22 millimetres. Presented with this same scenario today, what would you do? Most geotechnical consultants would go straight, straight through a three-dimensional analysis incorporating a soft soil creep model or similar uh, for the clay. So I decided to undertake such analysis, assuming the exact same inputs as I did for the previous analysis. The model took my analysis about five uh, days to set up, uh, had a run time of about 16 to 24 hours uh, for each run. Such long run times are not conducive to sensitivity analysis or analysing different numbers of H-piles or different configurations. The calculated settlement of the tower is shown in the coloured colour <coughs> contour plot on the right. A maximum of about 40 millimetres of settlement, or double that measured, is indicated. The Plexus 3D analysis also calculated greater loads in the H-piles and indicated that an acceptable solution would require more H-piles than were actually installed. Whilst there are a number of reasons why the Plexus 3D overestimated the settlement of the tower, one of the main contributors was the H-pile stiffness in the Plaxis 3D uh, analysis was calculated by the program. If we'd actually used the uh, measured stiffness of the piles, I think we would have got a better answer. This example is not to criticise Plaxis or the models we use. It just simply shows us that simple analysis can provide reasonable results and provide a flexibility not easily obtained with the more complex analysis methods. In the analysis of most, if not all, problems, three-dimensional analysis should not be the first or the starting point. Simpler two-dimensional analysis can provide important insights into the problem at hand. This is also demonstrated in my next and final example. My final example illustrates <coughs> one of the significant benefits of soil structure interaction analysis, in that it provides us with the ability to extend well beyond past experience and to analyse, design and construct structures that have never been built before. This slide shows many of the very tall towers that have been built around the world prior to 2014, including the Burj Khalifa standing at 828 metres. Unfortunately, the slide doesn't include your recently completed load tower, which stands at 555 metres. The Nakhteel Tower in Dubai was designed to stand at well in excess of 1,000 metres. With a diameter of about 100 metres and a mass of over 20 million tonnes, it was the tallest and one of the heaviest buildings ever to be planned. Unfortunately, due to the onset of the global financial crisis, the building was not completed. About two-thirds of the footing system was installed, 
prior to the works being stopped. What follows is a brief description of the analysis design of the footing system. The subsurface stratigraphy at the Nikhil Tower site comprised about 20 metres of variable cemented sand overlying a soft carbonate rock called calci siltite. The calci siltite has a relatively high void ratio and high stiffness. However, the strength of the calci siltite as measured in unconfined compressive strength testing is only in the range of 1 to 2 MPa with no significant increase until below 80 metres depth. Below about 80 metres depth, the calci siltite is embedded with gypsum, uh, which exhibits as a strong rock. Early design considerations concluded the tower would need to be supported on a piled raft with a raft founding in the calci siltite at about 25 metres depth. The foundation concept comprised the installation of a 30 metre deep circular diaphragm wall, about 100 metres in diameter, installation of the foundation piles barrettes, excavation to foundation level, followed by the construction of the raft. With a tower of this mass founding in relatively weak material, understanding the various aspects of the footing system was paramount. Of particular interest is, is the ground immediately below the raft to assess bearing pressure and settlement. Also, along this, the ground along the pile shaft for strength for bearing, the geology, permeability, excavatability and stability for pile construction, the stiffness for settlement and the interaction and pile shaft resistance. At the pile toe, for end bearing and other factors that I just mentioned, including pile excavation, pile height, stability, and of course, base debris. And finally, most importantly, the ground below the base of the pile to at least 200 metres depth, if not more, as the compression of this material will be a significant con contributor to the total settlement and tilt of the tower. One of the key aspects of the design was to understand the settlement performance of the tower and as a result the ground investigation concentrated on obtaining compressibility and stiffness information. One aspect of behaviour of the calci siltite that was observed in high pressure odometer tests was a relatively low compression at low vertical stresses followed by a collapse of the structure once a certain pressure, which we will call the bond yield strength, was achieved. The bond yield strength is analogous to a pre-consolidation pressure for over-consolidated clays. It would appear that the carbonate cementation, the calcium siltite, was suffi sufficient to maintain the relatively loose structure until the bond yield strength was reached, at which point the cementation broke down, uh, causing increase in pore water pressures, consolidation and creep. This was a concern and this could lead to significant long-term settlement and tilt in the tower and perhaps we could end up with the Leaning Tower of Dubai. Another aspect of the calci siltite performance was that it was very difficult to obtain suitably undisturbed samples from depths from 50 metres to 300 metres. As a result, laboratory tests significantly underestimated the in-situ strength and stiffness of the calci siltite. For this reason, high re reliance was placed on in-situ pressure meter and cross-hole seismic testing, as well as full-scale barrette tests using Osterberg cells. A typical pressure meter test at a depth of 142 metres is shown in the lower figure. The shape of the pressure expansion curve is very similar to that of an undrained test in clay and, and quite different to that in rock. And this is consistent with the bond yield strength hypothesis indicated earlier. As the primary aim of the footing design was to maintain changes in stress below the bond yield strength, it was decided that complex constitutive model was not required. And instead, a very simple Tresco criterion for the calcium siltite where the strength of materials defined by the bond yield strength was adopted. This was used in all subsequent soil structure interaction analyses. This slide shows a plan of the final footing system adopted. Barrettes were used instead of piles due to the uh, difficulty at the time of constructing piles to the depths required. Barrett plan dimensions were 1.2 to 1.5 metres by 2.8 metres, with lengths ranging between 60 metres and 84 metres below ground surface. The number of barrettes finally adopted was significantly more than was indicated from our soil structure interaction analysis as a local authority required a factor of safety of 2.5 on every barrette. Even the numerous meetings we couldn't uh, convince them to relax this criterion. The length of barrettes compared to the height of the tower is shown to the right of the screen. The raft thickness varied between 2.5 metres and 8 metres depending on location. Our approach to the analysis of the footing system comprised three stages. 
The first was done to take relatively simple axisymmetric analysis of the tower using Plaxis 2D and of pile groups using a repute program called, sorry, a pile group program called repute. One of the Plaxis 2D models is shown here, and you can see it's relatively simple. The axis symmetry is on the left-hand side of the figure. The aims of these analyses were to understand the likely performance of the footing system by investigating the impact of varying key inputs, including the number and length of barrettes, the soil properties, the pile shaft and base resistances, including the potential for debris at the base of the barrettes, the likely increase in stress below the barrettes, and the bearing pressure beneath the raft. The analysis also provided preliminary spring stiffness values to the structural engineers who were designing the tower. The design progressed using an iterative approach, as is common for many towers of this point, or well, many towers. The structural engineer then provided us with updated column modes and moments, which we would then use in our model to calculate updated stiffness values. This process continued until reasonable agreement between the structural and geotechnical models was achieved. On the basis of these simple models, the footing system was developed and refined. Stage two of the design commenced once the details of the footing system had been essentially finalised, with only minor future refinements envisaged. During this stage, we undertook three-dimensional modelling of the footing system to confirm footing performance and provided up stiffness, updated stiffness values for the detail designed by the structural engineers. The analysis were undertaken for a number of scenarios, including credible upper bound, credible lower bound, and best estimate of properties, and for every design serviceability limit state and ultimate limit state cases. On the basis of our two-dimensional models and field barrettes test, it was decided the potential presence of debris at the base of the barrettes had to be included in our analysis and design. As this debris would be essentially incompressible under short-term loading, it was decided to use the full base resistance for short-term wind loading and no base resistance for long-term loading. The final stage of our analysis was to consider the variability of the ground and estimate the potential tilt and differential settlement of the tower. The variability of the ground was assessed by using a simple scratch test on the rock core immediately following its retrieval from the borehole. This scratch test provided a continuous, relatively crude, but quantitative measure of the hardness of the calcisiltite over the full depth of each borehole. This was then calibrated with the modulus of the ground as assessed from the pressure meter and cross-hole seismic testing, and probability distribution for Young's modulus developed. A simple analytical approximation to the stress distributions below the piles were then developed and used in a Monte Carlo simulation carried out within a spreadsheet. From this, the probability versus settlement profiles at each borehole as shown here were calculated, and the design team considered the probability of the tower experiencing unacceptable settlement or tilt was very low. So in summary, we have come a long way since the days of Professor Shevatoria. We now use SSI analysis every day in the design of a wide range of structures. The fundamentals that applied in Professor Shetariev's time still apply and are critical to undertaking reasonable SSI analysis. Of particular importance are understanding the mechanics of the problem, identifying the critical soil and rock characteristics, and behaviour and modelling the correct construction process. It is not valid to factor down properties in SSI analysis to satisfy, satisfy requirements of local standards. There must be a balance between practicality and complexity in our SSI analysis and advanced analysis should not be the first and only step in the process. In order for us to have confidence in the results of our SSI analysis, we must understand the limitations of the analysis, we must adopt a range of approaches, and we must undertake sensitivity analysis and checks. We then must temper this all with our experience. So I thank you for listening. I invite you all to Sydney in 2021 for a geotechnical discovery down under Aussies love to entertain. Our hospitality and friendship are well known, and we are great hosts, and we host memorial conferences. I hope to see you there. Thank you very much.